welcome to everyone who's joining us. We're going to get started in just a minute. Um, but thank you for joining us for day three of Stormwater Awareness Week. It's been a great week so far, and we really hope that you enjoy um, this workshop as well as the remaining workshops of the week. But it is right about 10 o'clock, so to give Danny all the time he needs for his presentation, I'm going to hand it over to him. So thank you, Danny, for presenting today. Awesome. Thank you, Rebecca. Well, I appreciate everyone who's joining today. Um, my name is Danny Spiris and I, I work with WGR Southwest and I've been working in the environmental field for about four and a half years now and have been blessed to be exposed to several different uh, environmental permits and regulations. And so when I was trying to figure out what topics I wanted to talk about, there were two uh, that kind of came to mind. And so those two topics are exploring, uh, let me get here exploring uh, SPCC plans and hazardous waste management in California. So SPCC is a short for spill prevention control and countermeasure plans. So um, as we go through the presentation, these are the main two topics that we'll hit. I do have a little roadmap here for us. So our two main topics, SPCC plans and basic hazardous waste management. And for SPCC plans specifically, we're just gonna do an overview of what they are, who needs them, uh, we're going to look at the different tiers of SPCC plans, and also we're going to discuss uh, key components. During the key components section, we're also going to be quoting uh, regulations straight from 40 CFR Part 112, which is where SPCC plans come from. And then for ba uh, basic hazardous waste management, it's going to be basically the same, just a general overview of hazardous waste regulations. Um, we're going to talk about how to manage hazardous waste and then just common violations that I've seen over the four years um, helping clients with their hazardous waste management. But before we jump into 40 CFR Part 112 for SPCC regulations, I kind of wanted to give just a little bit of regulatory background. So you, you may know the answer to this already, but what major event led to the Clean Water Act? As you may already know, it was, you know, the 1969 Cuyahoga River fire, right? Um, when I was doing research on this and I was pulling photos, it, it's just it's just weird to me to see a river on fire. I mean, some of these photos here, as you'll see in a little bit, just show how bad um, the pollutant sources were in this water. Uh, this next photo specifically shows, you know, a reporter, uh, a Cleveland reporter in the 1960s just dipping his hand into the water and then just being caked in oily sludge, right? This is not something that belongs in water. Uh, this is like hazardous waste that I would see, you know, for a client doing steel manufacturing. Here's another photo here of, uh, of a councilman dipping a white cloth into the river and pulling it out. Uh, I just, I can't imagine if our country was still operated this way. If our environmental regulations never really pushed past that and this is how we operated, it, it would be a pretty bad world. But thankfully, uh, that's not the case for us and that we've made good strides in the right direction to protecting our local waterways. And so there are other events that happened that kind of bolstered these SPCC regulations. You may know these two instances, but we have a a 4 million gallon oil spill from an above ground storage tank into the Mongolia River near Pennsylvania. And the second big one, which led to the Oil Pollution Prevention Act of the 1990s, is the 11 million gallon oil spill discharge into the Prince William Sound in Alaska. Right, so that 11 million gallon oil discharge affected 1,300 miles of shorelines and it had an immense impact on fish and wildlife. So as I mentioned earlier, oops, excuse me. Uh, this event in particular gave way to the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, which was passed by Congress, which essentially just gave the Environmental Protection Agency more power to prevent oil spills. So with that um, kind of regulatory background in mind, uh, 40 CFR Part 112 comes out of the Clean Water Act. So I'm just going to read these next two slides here for you. The Federal Clean Water Act authorized the oil pollution prevention regulations. The United States Environmental Protection Agency, or the US EPA, established the oil pollution prevention regulations under Title 40, Code of Federal Regulations, or CFR for short, Part 112. These regulations apply to non-transportation facilities that could reasonably be expected to discharge oil into, the, into or upon the navigable waters of the United States 
and have a total above ground oil storage capacity of 1,320 gallons or a total underground oil storage capacity of over 42,000 gallons. Oil is defined by the regulations as oil of any kind or in any form, including but not limited to petroleum, fuel oil, sludge, oil refuse, and oil mixed with waste other than dredge spoil. The State, Act of Calif uh, the State of California Above Ground Petroleum Storage Act also requires transportation related facilities to prepare and implement an SPCC plan. So uh, the 40 CFR Part 112 came out, I believe, in 1973 of December out of the Clean Water Act. And there have been amendments since then, and I believe we're operating under the last amendments, which were released in July of 2002. If I'm if I'm off on that date, you guys can correct me in the chat there. But um, I also want to touch on the oil definition. You know, it's it's based on oil and petroleum based products, but also this does include animal fats, you know, like beef tallow and also seed oils as well. All right, so let's start talking about SPCC plants. So uh, SPCC plants are designed to prevent oil discharges into navigable waters or adjoining shorelines. These plans must be developed in accordance to 40 CFR part 112. And there are three different tiers of SPCC plans. Now I wanna be clear, in the SPCC regulations, it doesn't state that there's three, it only specifically states tier one, tier two. However, I like to break it down into three and I'll kind of explain why when we get to that section. So who enforces 40 CFR part 112? Well, the three major enforcing bodies is going to be the United States Environmental Protection Agency, so the EPA, also your local environmental health department, uh, or your certified unified program agency, and your local fire department. Now, the majority of calls that I receive from clients are not because they've received inspections from the EPA or the fire department, but mostly it's from their county COOPA. Um, very rarely do I receive calls about the EPA inspecting um, my client sites. I think I only have one client that really deals with the EPA. So who needs an SPCC plan? Well, generally speaking, it's a facility that stores, processes, refines, uses, or consumes oil in a non-transportation related activity. Your facility can be reasonably expected to discharge oil in quantities that may be harmful into navigable waters or adjoining shorelines. So if you have a total above ground storage capacity of 1,320 US gallons or more of an oil-based product on site, or a total buried storage of 42,000 US gallons of oil on site, then you, you need an SPCC plan. Now in this total, the SPCC regulations does not consider anything less than 55 gallons. The total only considers 55 gallons or greater containers, right? So let's say, for example, you have a 35 gallon drum of hydro, uh, hydraulic oil on site. That does not get included into your total storage capacity. Also, what's not included in your total storage capacity is permanently closed containers. So let's say, for example, you have a 5,000 gallon red dye diesel tank that's been decommissioned. You no longer use it. It's still on site, but it's been properly closed out and emptied. If we're doing a, a SPCC applicability inspection just to see if, if an SPCC plan still applies to your facility, that amount, that 5,000 gallon tank that's been decommissioned will also not be included in your total above ground storage. So the only time that we will talk about those decommissioned tanks is if for some reason you still need an SPCC plan and that plan specifically will mention that this tank has been decommissioned, you know, we'll date it, you know, since, you know, July of 2005. Also, what's not considered is single family residences using heating oil containers and pesticide application equipment and related mixed containers are also not considered. Okay, moving on. This is actually a, uh, a great flow chart. I believe this was released by the EPA. You can find this online, but if you're curious about your SPCC applicability to your specific facility, just follow this flow chart of questions. Um, if you need this resource, I will have my email posted through the presentation. So you can email me, ask me for the link and I'll send you what I have. So we mentioned this earlier, uh, but we have three different tiers that we're gonna break down 
in this in the regulation specifically it only mentions two but tier one is for people who have over 1320 gallons of an oil or petroleum based product on site they have less than a total storage capacity of 10,000 gallons and they have no single tank over 5,000 gallons in size this is your tier one simple self-certified plan there is an epa template that you can use Generally, when I have clients that apply for um, a tier one plan and they don't need anything above that, I always recommend, hey, you know, you can do this on your own. I can I can offer guidance, of course, and I have no problem doing that. But I believe uh, the templates provided by the EPA are simple enough for for people to walk through. Now, tier two is for people who have 1,320 gallons or more. Uh, they still have less than 10,000 gallons of a total storage capacity on site. But in this case for tier two, they have one tank that is over 5,000 gallons in st uh, total storage capacity. Now tier two is still a self-certified plan, uh, but you can't use the tier one EPA template. Generally in tier two, um, I would recommend just creating essentially a full-fledged SPCC plan without the PE certification, which we'll talk about here, tier three, All right? So tier three is the full-fledged plan. Um, this is a binder plan. Uh, this requires PE certification. It requires an inspection on site. And so uh, for people who have um, over 10,000 gallons of total storage capacity, they have at least one tank over 5,000 gallons in size those people will, will need a PE certified plan. Now, the two bottom bullet points on this slide are kind of um, circumstantial. So if your facility has a discharge of 1000 gallons to an adjoining shoreline or navigable water of an, of an oil or petroleum based product, uh, if you have a single discharge of that, you will need a PE certified plan, regardless of how much you have on size. And then the second circumstantial point to this is, if you have two discharges of oil to navigable waters to an adjoining shoreline of 42 gallons or more within 12 months, you will also need a PE certified plan. So it just depends on, on what happened at your facility. So this isn't an exhausted list by no means, and I'm not suggesting that these are the only types of facilities that need SPCC plans, but in general, the list that I have here um, are the facilities that I've personally worked with. So uh, agriculture, logistic companies, gas storage facilities, maintenance yards, landscaping material storage, concrete batch plants, and then active construction sites. So uh, you may be asking yourself at this point, um, you know, are your SPCC plans brand new? You know, do you write these from, from scratch or are they ma the majority of them at this point uh, existing plans that you're updating? Well, it, it would be it would be the second point. Majority of the plans that I do now are updating plans um, based on old plans that have been in place. Very rarely do I get a facility now that needs a brand new SPCC plan because they've never had them. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. Uh, we do have an a industrial general permit sector in our company here, and from time to time, I'll have a colleague that will mention, "Hey, one of my clients needs an SPCC plan." They didn't know they needed one. When I was doing an inspection today, I picked up on that they had, you know, so many gallons of an oil petroleum based product. So I still get brand new plans, but the majority of them, and I would say about 90, 95% are existing plan updates. All right. So key components of an SPCC plan. So the main things, um, and this kind of goes for kind of your tier two, tier three, the tier one EPA template is, is a, a bit watered down. It still has some of these key components, but I'm gonna be kind of referring to the tier two, tier three plans. You need a facility description, a facility diagram, oil storage information. You also want to list your spill scenarios and specifically your worst case spill scenario. You want to list secondary containment measures, spill prevention controls, your training and spill, uh, spill response procedures record keeping and inspection procedures, and also your security measures. So in this next few slides, I'm going to be listing regulations straight from 40 CFR part 112. Um, they're not exciting. They're, they're not super, uh, you know, they, they, don't, they won't keep you up or anything like that. But uh, try to pay attention to these because these are going to kind of be backing up the list that I just mentioned here. So we'll start with the main one here. 
40 CFR part 112.7. So if you are the owner or operator of a facility subject to this part, you must prepare a plan in accordance with good engineering practices. This plan must have full approval of management at a level of authority to commit the necessary resources to fully implement the plan. You must prepare the plan in writing. Now, 40 CFR Part 112.7 has your general provisions of what your SPCC plan needs. So I'm going to start listing out some of those bullet points here. So 40 CFR Part 112.7.A.1 states, include a discussion of your facility's conformance with the requirements listed in this part. And then point A.2 point lists, comply with all applicable requirements listed in this part. You must state the reasons for non-conformance in your plan and describe in detail alternative methods on how you will achieve equivalent environmental protection. So now 40 CFR part 112.7.8.2 mentions something really important. And it's the last three words there. It's equivalent environmental protection, or you can just say environmental equivalence for short. Uh, this is a really important tool to have in your SPCC writing toolkit. And I'll explain what that is here in this next slide, but essentially, uh, with environmental equivalence, you can argue alternate uh, methods of achieving compliance with the standard other than what's listed. So I'm going to use a, uh, a diagram that I made. It's not too great here, but it'll kind of maybe get the idea of cross. So here's a facility. You know, the yellow is the facility boundary. The blue arrows is kind of stormwater flow on site. Um, and then you have a maintenance shop with oil storage. So this is the 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 part of the facility we're going to focus on here that we're going to argue environmental equivalence or an alternate method of achieving compliance and that blue circle on the bottom left hand is your storm drain so let's say for example uh, i have a client that has several 55 gallon drums of an oil-based product stored inside a maintenance shop but they don't have proper secondary containment let's assume that this main maintenance shop has um, a concrete foundation, and let's assume that it's covered, right? So there's really no worry or exposure to, um, to stormwater elements, and there's no worry or exposure to maybe um, a spill percolating into the ground, right? Because we have an impermeable surface. Now, let's say that this client has these 55-gallon drums on some type of dolly system or hand truck that they move around from vehicle to vehicle so they can discharge the product that they need. Now, getting secondary containment in this scenario for this client, it's going to be hard. Having him to store those 55 gallon drums on a spill pallet all the time is going to be difficult for the crew because they're going to have to constantly move drums off and off the pallet, putting them on the dolly. So based on this information, uh, it seems like that I'd be able to argue environmental equivalence. I'm going to argue an alternate method of secondary containment for this client. Uh, so I'm going to ask the, the owner of this company, hey, Instead of putting your drums on 55 gallon pallet, or excuse me, on spill pallets, because you have a covered storage area, because you're on a non-permeable surface, and I'm just going to throw out a number, and because you're about 200 feet away from your storm drain on your facility, there, there's a pretty low risk of spill here. So I'm going to suggest buy enough spill kit material to clean up one 55 gallon drum spill. So that's going to be my argument for environmental equivalent. So. They don't need to buy the spill pallet in this case, but I can argue because, because of the circumstances on site, I believe that spill to a storm drain or um, per percolating into a, let's say a permeable surface is very low. I'm gonna argue environmental equivalence. Now, this isn't a cookie cutter approach. Uh, environmental equivalence doesn't apply for every site and you need to be careful what you argue it for and make sure that you have evidence to back that argument. Because like I said, it's it's um, you're going against technically what's suggested in the 40 CFR part 112 and you're going to be arguing an alternate method of compliance. Sometimes um, if you have a county inspection, let's just say, and an inspector looks at your plan, they read that you're using environmental um, equivalents to achieve compliance with 40 CFR part 112. And let's say they don't like the argument. At that point, you're either going to have to bolster your argument, figure out ways to kind of make it more uh, reasonable, or you may even have to just go the secondary containment route, depending on who your inspector is and, and what they want to point out in your plan. All right, so next point, 40 CFR part 112.7.8.3, describe in your, your plan the physical layout of the facility and include a facility diagram 
which uh, must mark the location and contents of each fixed oil storage container and the storage area where mobile or portable containers are located. The facility diagram must also include all transfer stations and connecting pipes, right? So in this specific section, we're talking about listing the type of oil in each fixed container, your discharge prevention measures. We're talking about uh, what drainage controls and secondary containment measures that you have in site. Uh, we should be discussing, uh, you know, countermeasures for discovering a discharge, response, and cleanup, how you're going to deal with the used cleanup material. And also in this section, we're going to want to list a contact list and phone numbers for your facility response coordinator, your emergency response numbers, such as the National Response Center, your cleanup contractors, and all the applicable federal, state, and local numbers that you'll have to um, call if there is a discharge of oil. Now, 40 CFR Part 112.7.B says, where experience indicates a reasonable potential for equipment failure, such as loading or unloading equipment, or any other equipment known to be a source of discharge, include in your plan a prediction of the direction, rate of flow, and total quantity of oil, which could be discharged from the facility as a result of each type of major equipment failure. This section specifically, we're going to be listing all of your transfer areas. And then in, in those transfer areas, we're gonna be talking about um, potential oil spills from those transfer areas. And we're gonna do the same for storage areas, piping, and also where you use your product. 40 CFR part 112.C says, provide appropriate containment or divisionary structures or equipment to prevent a discharge. The entire containment system, including walls and floor, must be capable of containing oil. It must be constructed so that any discharge from a primary containment system, such as a tank, will not escape the containment system before cleanup occurs. So this section uh, points out secondary containment measures for structures. And in the regulations, it does list examples of what can be used, right? So we have dikes, berms, retaining walls, curbing, drip pants, sumps, collection systems, retention palms, and even sorbent materials. All right, so 40 CFR part 112.7.E says, conduct inspections and tests required by this part in accordance with written procedures that you or the certifying engineer develop for your facility. You must keep these written procedures and a record of the inspections and tests signed by the appropriate supervisor or inspector with the SPCC plan for a period of three years. So a couple things here. It gives us a time frame of how long we need to keep SPCC related documents on site, right? So three years. Now for inspections, for tank inspections specifically, there are two leading types here that we typically deal with. There's the API 653, which is your massive, large field erected tanks. Those ones aren't shop built. They have to be built on site. And then there's also the STI SP001, which is your Steel Tank Institute tank standard. And those are for shop built steel tanks. About, goodness, about maybe 95% of the time I'm dealing with STI. Very rarely am I dealing with 653. I think I only have one client that deals with 653. But the majority of my clients have shop built steel tanks that are purchased, you know, and delivered and installed on site. So whatever tank inspection standard that you have, I highly recommend having a copy of that tank inspection standard for you to look through. So on top of this SPCC plan, I would recommend having your tank inspection standard, learn it, figure out what the requirements are and who needs to inspect and how often. And then we have 40 CFR part 112.7.F.1. At a minimum, train your oil handling personnel in operation and maintenance of equipment to prevent discharges. Discharge procedure protocols, applicable pollution control laws, rules and regulations, general facility operations, and the contents of the uh, facility SPCC plan. So this SPCC training needs to be given uh, once per year, and you have to ensure that there's an adequate understanding of the SPCC plan of the people who are involved with it. Um, now, one thing that I suggest adding to this SPCC training is a spill response training. So at WGR, we have something called the kick the bucket drill. Um, it's essentially this, this hands-on spill prevention training that uh, we give. We do have a free PDF that we can send to you guys so that you can do this with your staff. I believe it's a great way to see how well your, your facility is prepared to respond to a spill. So in light of that, I actually made a small video to kind of describe what that is. So let me go here. 
Hi, my name is Danny Spears and I work with WGR Southwest and I am so excited that you're here with us for Stormwater Awareness Week 2024. I have a training that I wanted to share with you that you can give to your staff. This training is a great way to test our knowledge when it comes to spill response protocols and to see if your staff is prepared for a spill. There is also a free PDF document that I can provide to you that can show you what you'll need and what questions you can ask your staff during the training. This video is basically going to cover that PDF document and it'll give you an idea of how to set this up. So let's talk about the setup. You're gonna need a clean five gallon bucket and fill it with clean tap water. You're gonna look on site for a good location, one that is out of the way of traffic and away from hazards to keep your staff safe during the scenario. You wanna place that bucket of water upgrading of where the drain is going to be so it can flow to it. Also, inspect your spill supplies, see what you have. It's okay if you don't have enough. Like I said before, this is a great way to test the knowledge of your staff and the preparedness of your staff. So if the facility is not ready for a spill, that's what this training will show. Once you've gathered the necessary materials for your training, you have your five gallon bucket of water and you also have checked your spill supplies. At this point, you're going to want to start gathering your staff around the location that you picked. Have them stage around the five gallon bucket of water. At this point in the training, you're going to start describing your scenario. And in the PDF document, we describe this scenario as pipe cutters were on their way out to lunch and they left a five gallon bucket of cutting oil on their tailgate. At this point, you're going to want to kick the bucket over towards the drain. The water should start flowing that way. Once you've described your scenario, you can start asking the staff your questions. So the PDF document that we provide lists several questions that you're going to want to start asking your staff at this point. One of them being is, well, what do we do now? This five gallon bucket of cutting oil is now on the way to the drain. Usually the responses will be, well, we need a spill kit. And at this point you can ask, well, where is the spill kit material located? You want to send some of your staff to go grab that spill kit. And with the other staff, you want to discuss other potential <coughs> hazards with the location of the spill. One of these could be traffic. You know, cars can track material around the site. Now, once some of your staff has returned with some of the spill kit material, start using that spill kit material. Again, we're using this as a scenario to test their preparedness, so you're going to lose a little bit of material in this training exercise. However, I believe it will be beneficial for your staff to know, are they able to properly clean up a spill? Do they know how to? Things in this training that they'll ask after the spill has been cleaned up is, what do you do now? Who do you notify? What do you document? Did any of this material go down the drain? These are all questions that we list on the PDF. Now at this point, your staff has cleaned up the spill and you've discussed the notification procedure questions listed on the document. But what do you do now? Well, it's not over yet. You've cleaned up the spill, but what do you do with the material? It's considered hazardous waste now. So you're gonna to have to contact your local disposal facility, and have them profile the waste and have it shipped off. Once you've had the waste profiled and shipped off by a hazardous waste facility, you have the area cleaned up, you've gone through the proper notifications and documentation procedures. Does the spill end there? Well, it depends. If any of the material reached the drain, there will be remediation efforts that will happen in that drain and wherever that drain leads to. Also, depending on the location of the spill, you may need to look for oil sheets. If there's cracks in the asphalt or in the cement that you did it at, most likely during a rain event, oil will come up from that. I hope this video was helpful to you and it provided you some insight on how to give this training to your staff. As I mentioned earlier, I do have a PDF document that I can send to you for free that will help guide you through giving this training. Again, thank you so much for joining us for Stormwater Awareness Week 2024. All right. So this is kind of what the PDF document looks like. Um, it tells you what you need. Uh, the scenario, how you're going to stage it, and then the bolded items here at the bottom uh, show what questions that you'll have. Now, there's one more regulation that I want to touch upon here, and that's 40 CFR Part 112.7.G. So this is describing your plan, how you secure and control access to the oil handling, processing, and storage areas, secure master flow and drain valves, prevent unauthorized access to starter controls, on oil pumps, secure out of service and loading and unloading connections of oil pipelines, 
and address the appropriateness of security lighting to both prevent acts of vandalism and to assist in the discovery of oil discharges. All this is referring to is just your security measures on site. So for SPCC plans, they do require a five-year SPCC review, right? So you must review your plan every five years to include any changes in oil storage or spill prevention procedures or equipment at your facility. If you have a PE certified plan, and you have a, a technical amendment, you must have that plan recertified within six months of those technical amendments and changes on site. So we might be asking, what's a technical amendment? Uh, well, here's just a few that kind of jotted down, right? If you're commissioning a new tank or decommissioning an, an old tank, if you're changing piping, one of the biggest ones is if you're changing anything to your secondary containment, let's say you're adding tanks, um, let's say you're changing the size of your containment walls or even product changes can be considered a technical amendment. All right, so that does it for our first half of the training here on SPCC plans. I'm gonna try something new here. I'm not sure how well it will work, but I'm gonna do a pop quiz. And now to incentivize you, uh, you can win a $5 digital gift card to Starbucks. So uh, whoever likes coffee should participate in this. So there is a few rules though. For this section, there's gonna be two quiz questions. Okay, and uh, the first person to email me the correct answer will win a $5 digital gift card. I'll, I'll email it to them after, after the presentation's over. However, if you do end up winning, you can only win once. So you can't win 10 bucks this round, okay? So it's only $5 for the whole presentation for you. You're more than welcome to still participate, but uh, after that, I wanna try to give people you know chances to win. So uh, I'm gonna give you a second. Prime your emails. If you're, if you're asking why not do it in the chat, well, I don't want everyone to start, you know, throwing their emails in the chat for me. So it'd be easier for me to get your email in my email box and I can just send you the digital gift card. Oh, and one more thing, if you can just include your first name, just so I know I, you know, who to address it to. But uh, we're going to start here in just a few seconds. I'm going to give you guys just a chance to, to put in my email. All right, here we go. Five, four, three two, one. So which tank inspection standard is typically used for shop built steel tanks? I'm going to give you a second here. Is it A, STI, B, API, or C? Oh, there we go. We got our first answer in, second answer in. All right, I think Cameron won here. He sent in the first correct answer. So the answer to this was STI, right? Steel Tanked Institute, SP001. Congratulations, Cameron. So I will send you that gift card after. Um, the shop built steel tanks is through STI SP001. Uh, API 653 is generally used for field erected tanks. Good job. Thanks for participating. All right, we got one more question on this section. Another chance. I'll say, Cameron, congratulations. You won the $5 gift card. You can't win another one, but you're more than welcome to participate. All right, number two. Based on the scenario below, what tier of SPCC plan will be required? So this is an onshore facility that conducts maintenance on large construction equipment and has fueling operations on site. There is a 5,000 gallon red dye diesel tank in secondary containment. 1055 gallon drums of motor oil and 1055 gallon drums of hydraulic oil. This facility, oh, I think we're already getting questions in. There you go, Charlotte. Yes, Charlotte, you got it. So uh, congratulations, you got a $5 gift card to Starbucks. It is full PE certified plan. Um, if, it, if they didn't have the spill, if they didn't have the 1,200 gallon spill to a navigable water body and it was just the requirements listed above, it would be tier two. But in this case, the correct answer is C. So congratulations, Charlotte. I'm gonna send you, I'm gonna make sure I highlight your guys' names here so I don't forget. Congratulations. All right, now there are two other opportunities later in this presentation to win a gift card. I'm hoping that we'll get through the material so that we have time to do it. So let's just jump right into the next section. All right, so hazardous waste management in California. Again, we're just gonna start with a brief overview of some regulations. 
So hazardous waste regulations are pooled from uh, 40 CFR Part 262. This section of regulation states that the general provisions for hazardous waste generators are defined in 40 CFR Part 261. So your types of hazardous waste generators are 261. The actual provisions are in 262. There are three types of generator statuses to consider in California. So we have very small quantity generators, right? So these people generate less than 220 pounds or 27 gallons of hazardous waste per month. And also, once they've reached their 200 pound capacity of waste, they are starting to, uh, uh, once, once they've reached 220 pounds, of, or excuse me, once they've reached 200 pounds of waste on site, their 180 day clock for disposal starts. So from that point on, they have 180 days to generate the waste and get it off site. Now for small quantity generators, right? These are people between 220 pounds or 2,200 pounds per month. And as soon as waste enters the drum or bucket, it must be removed within 180 days of accumulation or six months. And then for large quantity generators, these are people who generate more than 2,200 pounds of waste or 270 gallons or more of hazardous waste, liquid hazardous waste uh, per month. All right, and then as soon as waste enters the drum or bucket, it must be removed within 90 days of accumulation. So uh, generally people who are large quantity generators, it's, it's hard to manage waste, especially um, in terms of cost. I have a client that I help manage their hazardous waste for, and some of the items they dispose of is, you know, $1,400 a box. Um, you know, one of the waste streams, uh, oily sludge, I think is like six to $800 a drum and they can produce somewhere between, you know, 10 to 16 of those drums within a three month period, right? So it's very costly being a large quantity generator. But what defines those ones, there's 2,200 pounds of waste or 270 gallons or more, okay? Now, if you are any of these um, quantity generators, it's a, there's a very good chance that you need a California Environmental Reporting System account or SIRS. Right, so the thresholds for this uh, to need an account is if you have 55 gallons of liquid hazardous material or 200 cubic feet of compressed gas or 500 pounds of solid material, right? And that's pulled straight from um, the health and safety code 25507. So if any of those thresholds um, are on your site, uh, you need to create an account with SIRS to report all of those hazardous materials. Now, when I spoke to a regulator before, um, they told me the reason why we have this account, the SIRS account, is because if there is an emergency situation and first responders are coming to your site, they're going to review your submitted facility diagram for entrances and exits, where you store your material. Also, if they're putting out a fire, and let's say it so happens to be a chemical fire, there are certain chemicals that just don't play nice with water. So uh, if any of these thresholds, if you meet any of these thresholds on site, then you're going to definitely need a SIRS account. In California, there are two types of regulated waste. We have RICRA, which is federally regulated waste, and then we have non-RICRA, California regulated waste. Now, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on what defines RICRA and non-RICRA. I do know some waste off the top of my head that fit in those categories. Like, for example, RICRA waste in California could be like barium shavings. Those are still regulated under RICRA. And then non-RICRA is something like oily sludge or waste oil. Those are typically non-RICRA nowadays. If you have specific questions on, you know, what's a RICRA waste and non RICRA waste, one of the best resources that I found is actually contacting like a hazardous waste disposal facility that you're connected with and asking them. Um, it's their job to profile the waste and figure out what codes apply to what. Now, in your central accumulation area, this is the area that you store your hazardous waste. There must be sufficient aisle space to allow for unobstructed movement of emergency personnel and equipment to any area to contain or control fires or spills. So got to make sure that your, your central accumulation area is tidy, it's neat. Also, another thing you're going to want to look for in your central accumulation area or just your hazardous waste drums in general is to make sure that they have proper labeling, okay? So all hazardous waste containers must be properly labeled with a hazardous waste label. It needs to have the name and address of business, the physical state of the waste, so it's either solid, semi-solid, liquid, or contained gas. You also need to list your hazardous waste properties, right? This is ignitability, corrosivity, reactivity, and toxicity, 
and the contents of the waist. And also what's typically forgotten is when the drum starts getting used, a lot of people forget to put the accumulation date on there. Um, so, you know, remember that point. Your labels must be clean and readable. You wanna make sure you're checking for missing or faded dates. If your drums are stored in any place that, um, well, is a dirty workplace, let's say you're working with sludge, the, the labels just totally get destroyed. You're, you have to replace those from time to time. Um, also, if your drums are stored in direct sun somehow, let's say there's sun exposure, the dates will fade and, and the label itself will fade eventually, uh, depending on how long you keep it on site. So you may need to replace the label in that case as well. This photo here is um, a general hazardous waste label that's compliant with the state of California. It has all the necessary information on there for you to fill out. Um, but it's uh, generally your hazardous waste disposal facility will provide their has waste labels. But these labels are nice to have on hand just in case you don't have enough of the ones that are given to you by your hazardous waste disposal facility. You probably can pick these up like on Amazon or I think Ranger is a great place to look as well. Here's a photo of what a label from a hazardous waste hauler would look like, right? And it has all the necessary stuff on here. It has the type of waste. We have a liquid, right? It's uh, lead benzene. It's in a liquid state. These here are your state and federal codes, right? Here's our characteristic. It's a toxic waste. I whited this out just for, you know, um, just protecting the information of the client, but, you know, name, address, state, US EPA number, state EPA number. And then, like I said, generally what I see missing when I'm dealing with hazardous waste management is the accumulation start date. And then here is a general label of universal waste. We'll talk about what some universal wastes are. They're managed differently than hazardous waste. They have different timelines than hazardous waste. For universal waste items, um, it doesn't go by your generator status, so 180 days or 90 days, but instead you have a year to dispose of that universal, uh, universal waste offsite. So hazardous waste containers that are not actively being used must be closed. Do not overfill a hazardous waste drum. If a lid cannot be secured on the drum, then the drum is just too full. If one of your waste streams is metal or paper used oil filters, you have to make sure that those filters are drained completely before placing them into the drum. So here's a photo right on this left side here. I mean, that that's terrible. You, you can't put a lid on that. Uh, you can try, but I guarantee it won't work. And then here's actually two violations in one. We have uncontainerized material. It's left in a five gallon bucket. And then we got a little sneaky metal filter here thinking that he can hide from us. But no, these are bad examples. Lead acid batteries, they need to be stored off the ground and on a rack or pallet. Any damaged batteries um, that are, you know, might have the potential to leak need to be stored in some type of leak proof container and dated. And then areas where the battery had leaked will need to be removed of or and disposed of via hazardous waste. So this is really important. If you have leaking acid batteries on, let, let's say, you know, a cement floor or a concrete floor, um, if they do leak, that area technically needs to be excavated out and removed of via hazardous waste. So let's just store these batteries properly and try to avoid that. Now, uh, for hazardous waste, uh, there are weekly inspections that need to be done. Right, so hazardous waste accumulation areas should be inspected weekly for spills. We're looking for, you know, leaking, bulging, rusting containers, corroding. Are they damaged? Are they properly labeled and properly closed? Now, one fun fact, and I, I, I tried looking for this, but there is no mention of it needing to be documented. I don't know why. Um, it, it's kind of a funny thing, but when it comes to doing your weekly inspections, it is my professional opinion that you document them, even though you're not technically required to. The reason why is, is if you ever have a state, federal, or like a county audit, then you can have some proof that you're doing something, you know, weekly for, with your hazardous waste. So is your containers in good condition, right? These are bad examples. Rusty drums, bulging drums, not good containers. Here's some other ones here, right? We have five gallon, you know, buckets of, uh, of paint here at the top left corner, right? This stuff, you know, could have been used, but because it was left out and it was dried, now they have to dispose of it via hazardous waste. And then we have corroded drums. You know, none of these are suited for storing hazardous waste. Now, empty containers. Now, we're, I'm talking about hazardous materials here. So empty containers of hazardous materials, not waste, exceeding five gallons in size must be visibly labeled 
with a date that they were emptied and removed off site within one year of the date. So let's say you have a 55 gallon drum of um, charcoal coolant, okay? And you've used that, that material, that, that drum is completely empty now. You need to slap a empty label on there, it'll say empty, and then you date it. And from that date, you have one year to dispose of it off site. Um, containers that are five gallons or smaller of hazardous materials can be placed in the regular trash if they're California empty. So what's, what's California empty? If it's a pourable liquid, let's say for example, you have a one gallon 50 weight 40 hydraulic oil container, you turn it upside down and it's still dripping, that is not California empty. You can't toss that in the general trash, okay? And then for solid and semi-solid containers, right? Let's say you have a, um, a, a one or two gallon bucket of gear grease, right? You have to scrape as much of the contents out of that bucket as you can uh, before disposing of it in the general trash. And technically aerosol cans, when the propellant and product is completely gone, can be thrown in the general trash. However, I, I always kind of stay away from that. I typically dispose of aerosol cans via universal waste because you would have to confirm that those, those cans are 100% empty. And so this kind of leads us into our next section here, universal waste items, right? These are things such as fluorescent lamps, batteries, aerosol cans that are non-empty, right? I have several clients that dispose of their aerosol cans, at, uh, aerosol cans this way via hazardous waste, um, and then also mercury switches. So universal wastes, these specific types cannot go into general trash with the caveat of aerosol cans, on, depending on how you wanna manage that. Now, last slide here common violations. So these are just based on experiences that I had with county inspectors and clients. Typically the, the easiest low hanging fruit is improper labeling. So um, either it's missing labels, missing an accumulation date, maybe they're mislabeled wastes, right? Um, another one is uncontainerized material. This happens quite often when you're working at like a maintenance shop. And let's say an employee is draining a truck of its uh, of motor oil and they leave that motor oil in a drip pan. And let's say they leave it there for a day and they forget about it. And then we have a county inspection, right? That would be considered uncontainerized material. So whenever you're dealing with fluids from vehicles um, or draining equipment, I always recommend as soon as, um, as soon as you can to drain those liquids into the proper container. Uh, improper material storage. This kind of goes hand in hand with uncontainerized material. So like storing your material in five gallon buckets or other containers that are not designed to hold hazardous waste. Um, and then also missing manifest records from your pickups. Uh, that's a big one. Sometimes people forget that they need to store these things in a binder for three years. So if you are missing any manifest um, from your hazardous waste pickups, I would suggest contacting your hazardous waste disposal facility and getting a back, you know, back date of three years of all the records and keeping those on site. Okay, we made it. We have a few minutes here. Two more opportunities now for whoever didn't win uh, a $5 gift card to Starbucks. Our last winners were Cameron and then Charlotte, if I'm saying those names correctly. So you two can definitely still participate, but you can't win another card. So I'm gonna you know, try to give people other chances here. So same thing, prep your emails, uh, send me the email with the correct answer. We have two questions. I'll give you five seconds here before we jump into it. All right, five, four, three, two, and one. Universal waste can be disposed of in the general trash, true or false? I just said this, so I hopefully you remember it. Waiting for the first email. Can universal waste be disposed of in the general trash, true or false? Let's see here. I believe Deborah, I think you got it correct. I think you meant to say no, which yes, you are correct, Deborah. It is false. Congratulations. You got a $5 gift card to Starbucks. All right, next question. I'm gonna let you guys prep again. Give you five seconds to put my email in. This is gonna be the last question and then I'll, I'll check the comments here if there's any questions that I can answer before we finish off. All right, here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. 
All right, I produce 290 gallons of liquid hazardous waste each month. What generator status am I? A, B, or C? Very small, small or large? Oh, here we go. No, it's not that one. Oh, I got another one here. All right, Brian, I think you got it. Yep, yes, sir, you got it. It is C, large quantity. Congratulations. All right. So our winners, Brian, Deborah, Charlotte, and Cameron. I will send you gift cards after this presentation. Thank you so much, guys, for participating in that. I'm glad that uh, uh, some of you guys are going to enjoy a cup of coffee. So let me pull up the chat here. Um, do we have any questions, Rebecca, that we need to answer? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, starting back a little ways. Right around the start of the chat, so there's a question then more towards the end. Got it. Oh, I see him now. So uh, is the first one from, so what do you do when a facility purposefully orders five or 20 gallon containers of oil products that stay under the limit, but has more than 1,000 or 20 gallons on site? Technically, it doesn't apply. Since the SPCC rule only um, takes into account 55 gallon containers or greater, it, it doesn't apply to them. Um, the example that I've used before is kind of like, you know, a uh, AutoZone or Walmart or or Target, right? That have uh, oil containers on site, um, but because they're five gallons or one gallon or less, right? So, uh, so we're learn uh, like, uh, yeah, John actually already kind of answered this. You know, it's not a problem for the EPA because we're con we're concerned about large quantity spills. All right, let's see. I'm going to look here. Um, I believe so, um, uh, Mel. I, I'll have to look into that. That's a good question. Um, if, they're, if they're less than 220 pounds on site, uh, are they allowed to keep it longer than 180 days? I'm going to look into that. I actually don't have an answer for it, but I will write that down, and I will find an answer for that one. I would, if I were to guess... And, you know, so take this with a grain of salt because I'm not sure. I would imagine they would be able to hold that waste on site um, longer than the 180 day period since they didn't meet the minimum weight requirement. Um, and as long as the container is in good condition. All right. Um, only the central commission inspect weekly or do you do satellite commission? Oh, good question. So, um, the question here is, do you need to inspect only your central accumulation area or do you look at satellite accumulation? So um, I believe I believe the regulation only specifically states central accumulation. However, to be safe, the way I do it is I do everything. Um, and this is from, I think, Jolene here. Uh, I look at everything. I, I go to the central accumulation area and on my inspection forms, I also do satellite location areas. Um, just so that we can, you know, cross our I's, dot our T's type of thing and make sure that the drums that are stored at, at the satellite location areas are in good condition. But uh, spe specifically speaking in the regulation, I think it only states central accumulation area, but I'll double check on that one as well. Good question. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, so I see this question. Does anyone know why the um, the regulations of 4 CFR Part 112 doesn't state STR API? I don't think they. Uh, I don't think the EPA states exactly what tank standards we need, just so that um, there's freedom for standards to be developed. Um, I just know that the main ones that I know of are STI and API. All right. How are we doing time wise, Rebecca? You got about five minutes. Okay. Oh, we're good. Okay. So I can answer these ones. Um, so question here for secondary container requirements, can essentially a terminal uh, stormwater basin or let's see here, um, augered environment. Um, so uh, I don't believe so. Uh, the question here is if a terminal stormwater basin can be argued as um, environmental equivalents, it would depend. 
So for example, is this, is this basin uh, permeable, non-permeable? Is it a uh, soil based or is it a, a full concrete basin? Um, and it, it, are there any uh, drainage or discharge points that can occur? Typically, in my experience, I've never used a stormwater drainage basin as secondary containment, like the sole secondary containment. Um, I've always used it as a tertiary, so kind of like the, like the third line of defense. But I don't believe it would count um, as like, for example, let's say you had a 10,000 gallon single wall still tank. And we would argue that the basin would be its secondary containment. Um, I, I haven't done that before. I've always, um, uh, typically in those cases, I've always seen single wall tanks have some type of containment wall or they're a double wall tank, so they're self-contained. So I hope that answers the question here. Um, have you seen from regulators or secondary containment requirements for fuel delivery containers? Um, example, uh, is a tanker truck parked next to a fuel tank with secondary containment? Um, are pop-up secondary containment tarps typically required for deliveries? So those kind of get into the transportation side of, uh, of regulations. Um, the question here is asking, um, what are the containment requirements, secondary containment requirements for fuel delivery containers? Uh, example, a tanker truck parked next to a fuel tank with secondary containment. I see. So if I'm understanding the question correctly, we have a tank that is in secondary containment and we have a tank fuel delivery driver that's coming by and refueling that tank. That's kind of gonna, how I'm going to answer it. So that fuel delivery driver who was then using his tanker truck to pump into a fixed storage tank there's a couple things that need to happen. One, the facility needs to have procedures in place, right? So the, uh, for example, I'm just gonna shoot off a couple that I know of. Um, they needed to um, identify the presence of a spill kit before they stop fueling. They need to check uh, pipe connection hoses, uh, making sure that they're in good quality or if they're not damaged. Uh, also, and depending on what, um, how the fuel connection is happening. So there's two scenarios here. If, the, if it's just straight to the piping of the tank and it's being fueled and there's no let's say spill connection box they're going to need some type of drip pan um, to catch any drips or spills now in some cases i do have clients that have remote spill boxes that basically are contained self-contained spill boxes that they can uh, the, the tank truck driver can plug into and if there is a spill up to 20 gallons that containment box um, that's fueling the tank will hold it so but yeah there are procedures that need to be in place on site for those fuel tankers coming by to um, to uh, resupply the tank. Uh, have you seen any violations for no secondary containment with double wall tanks in pristine conditions? No, no. So, um, uh, have you? Uh, I, I haven't seen any violations like that before. Um, as long as the tank is double walled, you're solid. Um, now, there can be some things that come into play with that that might maybe increase inspection requirements or possibly facility changes. Sometimes you get tanks that are placed on permeable surfaces that are that are double walled and those aren't really ideal situations. However, generally, if I see either a single wall tank in a containment basin with uh, sufficient containment or a double wall tank, usually uh, the county generally has no issues with those. Um, now, a double wall tank uh, does need to be inspected if we're going based off of the STI SP001 needs to be inspected regularly uh, and I say regularly like I think it's every 20 years or so depending on the tank size and the in the area that's in installed and it needs to be checked obviously for um, if the exterior wall of the secondary containment is in good condition all right so I think right. that is all the questions all right. Well, thank you, Danny. And we're just almost out of time. So to wrap it up, if you haven't seen um, any of the workshops that already happen, you can catch the recordings on our website, stormwaterawareness.org. If you missed any portion of this workshop, it was recorded. It will be available to watch in about 24 hours, also on our website. And we've got a great lineup of workshops for the rest of the day. I want to highlight one that is happening at 1 p.m. Pacific time. We're going to go to the city of Calgary, Canada to learn about pitfalls and tips in developing an effective industrial, commercial, and institutional stormwater pollution prevention program. So even if you're not located in Canada, it's always good to hear what other people in the stormwater industry are doing and 
techniques that they're using and their successes. And so be sure to stop by that workshop and find out what Canada is doing for stormwater. So we're right at the hour. So thank you, Danny, so much for presenting and thank you everyone for attending.